Jesus. So that said, um, if you've got your Bibles or a Bible app, uh, why don't you open your Bibles with me this morning to Acts chapter 29. Acts chapter 29. I'll give you a minute to, to get there. <clears throat> Keep looking. You get, anybody? Are you there yet? There, there is no Acts chapter 29, right? <laughs> so, I mean, some of you are like flipping through your Bibles like 26, 27, 28, 20, 28. I think I've got a defective Bible. There's no chapter 29 of it. No, your Bible is fine. It is just, uh, uh, really, we're, we're not looking at Acts chapter 29 because there is no Acts chapter 29. Uh, what we're going to be doing this morning is, is more of a, of a review or, or really an overview of the book of Acts. And so we're going to go back to the beginning and then kind of highlight some of the other chapters and get all the way back to the end again and kind of have, a, have a, a, an overview of, of, of the book of Acts. Um, but the reason I had you, you know, try to find Acts chapter 29 is that you might remember last week in chapter 28, uh, the, apost the apost I'm sorry, Luke, at the end of that chapter, uh, he's writing this, and yet you read it, and it's kind of a, an open-ended book. You read it, and it's just kind of like, like it's unfinished. I mean, there's there's no, you know, the end. There's no happily ever after. There's no, like, you know, peace out or, or anything. There's nothing nothing that tells you that this thing is done, that this thing is wrapped up and finished. It was just kind of like an unfinished, open-ended book. In fact, it's been well said that, that you and I, that we, uh, that the church today is the 29th chapter of the book of Acts. And so throughout this study, in fact, we started this study about a year and two months ago. Yeah, and so uh, throughout this study, we've seen in many ways that the book of Acts really chronicles the birth of the church. But listen, the end of the book of Acts is not the end of the church. In fact, really, the, the end of, of Acts is just the beginning of the church. Because what the Holy Spirit uh, was, was doing in the early church, he continues to do in the church today, in the modern church today. But what the Holy Spirit uh, began to do in the book of Acts, he's going to continue to do in you. And so now let's, let's review this book. Let's kind of have an overview. And as we do this overview, let's see if we can capture the, the, the purpose of what the book of Acts was all about. So with that, let's pick it up in the beginning. Acts chapter 1. We're going to read the first five verses. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it says, uh, Luke says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up. And, and after he, he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them for 40 days and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said... You have heard from me, for truly John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, Father, as we as we get into your word, we, we pray, Lord, that you would you would speak to us today. That your Holy Spirit would, would, would minister to your church today just as you minister to your church in those days. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So now we're, we're looking at the beginning of all this. Now, you know, this reminds me, uh, last night, my uh, my family and I, we, we went to my daughter's performance. Now, now we homeschool. My, my daughter's 15, going on 16. But uh, we, we even though we homeschool, we, we, we've been doing this, this once a week, uh, kind of a, a co-op kind of a thing. And so at that school, they were having like an end of the year kind of a kickoff and, 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 a, and a performance. And so my daughter and her friend, uh, they, they performed this song. Now, this was a song that they wrote. Uh, and, and, then they, and then they performed it, and I gotta tell you, it was awesome. I mean, they did a, 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 an amazing job. But what it reminded me of was, was years ago, when, when my daughter was little, um, she comes home from this once a week school, and, and, and she's like, yeah, I think maybe in first grade, and she's like, Daddy, uh, Mrs. V Hill taught, taught us a new song, do you wanna hear it? But I'm like, sure, honey. And so she, she says, okay, well, it's called the Never Ending Song. <laughs> And she starts singing it. She's like, this is the song that doesn't end. Yes, it goes on and on, my friends. And she just keeps going and going and going and going. And, and I'm like, yeah, thanks for that, Mrs. Vigo. Uh, but, but, you know, in, in many ways, that could be the theme song for, for the book of Acts. Because in many ways, the, the book of Acts is never ending. It goes on and on and on. It just, it just keeps going. Now, what we're seeing here in chapter 1 is, is, is that, first of all, the book of Acts, if you remember, was the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> you know, uh, because they have the same author. 
So Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He thought that'd be a good name for a book that he wrote. Well, just call it the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and, and then after that, then he writes this, this follow-up, the book of Acts. And so Luke says in, 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 in verse 1, <clears throat> he says, The former account I, I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And so he, first of all, writes this book, he says, to a guy by the name of Theophilus. Now, Theophilus, by the way, is, is a Greek name. And in the original language, this is a name that means the lover of God. The lover of God. And so in an indirect way, uh, this, this book is really written to, to anybody who, who loves God, to anyone who's a lover of God. And so he says, uh, he says, I'm writing this to you, lover of God. Now, the, the next word to, to, to make note of is the word began in verse 1, when he says that I wrote to you uh, of all that Jesus began to both do and to teach there at the end of verse 1. Now, now in effect, Luke is saying, you know what? The, the last time I wrote you, when I wrote you the Gospel of Luke, I, I told you of all the things that Jesus began to do. I, I told you about his, his life. I told you about his ministry. I, I told you about his, his miracles and his, and his healings. I even told you about, about how he died on the cross and, and how he was buried in the tomb and how he rose again and, and, how, and how he ultimately ascended back up into heaven. But uh, that, that was not the ending. That was just the beginning. That was just the beginning. And so what we see is, is that the book of Acts picked up where the, where the gospel of Luke left off. That he began to minister in the gospels, but now we see that, that Jesus continued to minister on earth. Even though he was no longer on the earth, even though he was now up in heaven, he continued to minister on the earth through his church that's been empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, by the way, that word began, that, that's there in verse 1. In the original, this is in, in what might be called a, an infinitive tense. In other words, it wasn't past tense. It wasn't like a one-time thing. It wasn't like one and done. But rather, it was, it was ongoing. It was, it was a continuous activity. It was, it was a continuous motion, a continuous action. And so, in effect, it, it, it's telling us that, you know what? This is still going on. These things are still happening today, that, that Jesus is still working in this world through his church today. And so this is, this is the never-ending story, the book of Acts. Now in verse 2, he goes on and he says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after which he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. And so now Luke reminds us that before Jesus went up to heaven, he gave commandments to his 12 apostles. Now, what were those commandments? Well, if, if you remember in, in Matthew 28, 19, also Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, this has been called the Great Commission. And, 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 and you know, we, we tend to think that, you know, that the whole world ought to go to church. The whole world should go to church. But that's not what Jesus said. No, Jesus said that the church should go into the whole world. That the whole world doesn't need to come to us. We need to go to them. And, and, and if we notice, it says in verse 2 that this was a commandment. This was a commandment. In other words, this was not optional. This was a command. You see, this, these were, were their marching orders. And so the, the marching orders of, 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 of the early church, the marching orders of, of these 12 apostles are still the marching orders for the church today. But listen, just as they needed the Holy Spirit, we need the Holy Spirit in order to carry out those marching orders. And I bring this up because nowadays there's, there's, there's kind of a, a, a tendency to sort of do church, if you would, without the Holy Spirit. You know, to kind of rely on, on business techniques and, and, and marketing practices and, and all these different strategies. In fact, I like how uh, Francis Chan put it in his book titled The Forgotten God. Francis Chan says, quote, The benchmark of, of success in church services today has become more and more about attendance and less and less about the movement of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He says the quote-unquote entertainment model of the church, uh, largely adopted back in the 80s and 90s, while it alleviated some of the boredom for, for a couple of hours each week, it filled our churches with self-focused consumers rather than self-sacrificing servants attuned to the Holy Spirit. And so in many ways, we as the church today, we need to get back to our roots here in the book of Acts. 
That is, we need to get back to being a people who, who are rooted and depend upon the Holy Spirit, who rely on the Holy Spirit. And so now with that, let's pick it up and look at verses 6 through 8. And, and let's, let's, let's remind ourselves of the purpose of the book of Acts. The purpose of the book of Acts. It says again in verse 6, where Luke says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, It is not for you to know the, the, the times or the seasons which the Father has, has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, as we've mentioned once before, that verse there in verse 8, that is actually the, the outline for the whole book of Acts. You see, when you study the Bible, you, you discover that every book in the Bible, there's, you know, it's one book, but it has 66 miniature books in it. And every one of those 66 books, almost every one of them, comes complete with their own outline. And, and, and there's even a verse in there, usually, that, that is like, like the purpose statement for the book. It's telling you what this book is all about. And so for the book of Acts, this is that verse. Verse 8 is, is, is the outline. It's telling us the flow. It's telling us that this is going to go from Jerusalem to, to, to Judea, to Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. No, no, by the way, really the, the story of the book of Acts is, is, is really the story of how the Holy Spirit empowered us to be his witnesses. And this all started in Jerusalem, right? Acts chapter 2, it all started in Jerusalem. And so we see in the book of Acts that it, it started in Jerusalem. And then from there, it, 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 it traveled, and it spread, and it went to Judea. Now, that covers the first eight chapters of the book of Acts. So that's the first part of your outline. Chapters 1 through 8, it, it, it's going from Jerusalem to Judea. But then, it spreads from Judea, and it goes to Samaria. Now, that covers the second part of your outline, and that's chapters 8 and 9. It, it goes from Judea to Samaria. But then from there, then it spreads to the ends of the earth. And that covers chapters 10 through 28. 10 to the end of the book, but as I mentioned, there is no end to this book. And so it even includes us. We are the ends of the earth. It, 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 it's come all the way to the ends of the earth. And so really, when you think about it, we, we've seen over and over that, that the, the story in the book of Acts, it, it's not a story of the, of the ministry of Peter versus the ministry of Paul, but rather it, it's a story about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the main character in the book. And I mentioned it a second ago, but listen, when, when it talks about the ends of the earth, that's us right here in, 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 in Colorado, <coughs> in the United States. I mean, think about it. This whole thing started in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And little by little, bit by bit, it spread all the way from Jerusalem until finally it's reached over here to us. We're the ends of the earth. But think about it. The gospel, it, it, it did not spread uh, across the whole world because of the ingenuity of the church. It, it didn't spread uh, across the whole world because, because of business strategies and, and, and marketing plans and, and, and planning sessions. No, it spread across the whole world because of the Holy Spirit. Just like it says in Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So now that's the outline. The outline? Is, is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. But, but, but what's the purpose? What was the purpose of this book? Well, again, the purpose of the book of Acts is, is to chronicle how the Holy Spirit came upon his church and empowered his church to fulfill the Great Commission. How the Holy Spirit empowered us to, to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, again, we, we pointed out originally in, in verse 2, this was a commandment. It was a commandment. In other words, Jesus wasn't saying, hey, you know, if, if you happen to have the time, you know, if, if, if you happen to get around to it, could, could, you, could you do me a favor, you know, pretty please with, with, with sugar on top? No, no. He's saying, you know what, as, as your Lord and Savior, as, as your commander in chief, I am commanding you to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Amen. These were marching orders. This is why it's been called the Great Commission and not the Great Suggestion. But, but listen, oftentimes the Great Commission nowadays has become the Great Omission. Because there's, there's a lot of us who, who are afraid to share our faith. We're afraid to talk about Jesus. We're afraid to step out there and, and have these conversations. You know, people who, who were once on fire Christians and, and were excited about Jesus and loved telling people about Jesus, suddenly have become the frozen chosen. Yeah, and, and listen, 
It's true. Christians who don't evangelize eventually fossilize. Listen, it's sharing your faith. It's talking about Jesus. That's what keeps you young spiritually. That's what keeps you vibrant. That's what keeps you on fire. When you stop sharing that, you, you, you stop stoking the fire. In fact, a, a recent survey points out that, that 9 out of 10 people in America, 9 out of 10, cannot define what the Great Commission is. 9 out of 10. Now you're thinking, yeah, but they didn't ask you know, Christians. They just asked everybody, the general public. Well, listen to this. Another study says that, that more than 60%, more than 60% of Christians do not know what the Great Commission is. And in fact, one-third can't even define what the gospel is. One-third. So let me ask you, show of hands, how many of you uh, could, could tell me what the Great Commission is? Well, I hope you can. I just told you what it was a few minutes ago. <laughs> Damn, I knew I shouldn't have taken notes. I didn't know there was going to be a quiz. I, uh, you know, Mark 16, 15 again, right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And then it goes on in verse 16 to say, He who is believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. Now listen, that's the Great Commission. That's the message we're, we're, we're to bring out to the world. We're, we're, to, we're to bring the gospel to the whole world. But listen, we cannot reach this world in our own strength. We cannot reach this world in our own ability. We cannot, we cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. So I gave you the outline. You know, the flow of the book, the flow of the book, again, is it starts in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. But now let's, let's kind of follow that outline. Let's kind of look at, it, at, a, at, a, at a few chapters, bit by bit to the end, and, and kind of see how this all flowed. Now, we don't have time to, to read all these chapters, so let's just kind of sum this up. So after chapter 1, then we come to chapters 2 and 3, and, and what happened in chapters 2 and 3? Well, well, that was the birth of the church. You know, that, that was, that was uh, on the day of Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon a, 120 disciples that were gathered in the upper room praying, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes upon them like, like tongues of fire, I have no idea what that looks like, just tongues, you know, that were on fire. And I don't know, it's what it says, tongues of fire, you figure it out. But it says the Holy Spirit came upon them like tongues of fire. And the next thing you know, they, they're all speaking in tongues. In other words, speaking in foreign languages that they had never been taught. They just start speaking in these foreign languages. And, and then they spill out into the streets. And people hear this. And so they, they come to check it out. And they're trying to figure out what's going on. And then, of course, the skeptics, the, the critics, are all like, well, they're just drunk. Which, when you think about it, it's kind of a stupid criticism, right? I mean, you know, anybody here been around drunk people? I mean, we, we've all been around drunk people, right? In fact, you know, I used to be a drunk people. Huh. I'm drunk. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. And, you know, and I can tell you, having, having been around people who had, like, way too much to drink, I've seen a lot of crazy things, and I'm sure you have too. I mean, listen, I've seen people who, who drunk way too much get really, really loud when they talk, and I've seen people who drink too much, you know, kind of slur their words. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I've seen I've seen somebody after a few too many drinks, you know, who, who thinks he's Chuck Norris all of a sudden, right? But I'll tell you the one thing that I've never seen out of all the drunk people I've ever witnessed <laughs> is is somebody who's had like way too much to drink, and all of a sudden they start speaking in a foreign language they've never been taught. They're just like all of a sudden like parlez-vous français? <laughs> hey, don't worry, gato, Mr. Robato. <laughs> So obviously, I mean, this, it wasn't alcohol. It, it was the Holy Spirit. And so now Peter stands up, of course, and, and, and he explains what's going on. And, and then he quotes from the book of Joel. And, and then we're told that 3,000 people accept Christ as their Savior and become Christians. And that's when the church was born. But then, as you continue the book of Acts, you see that the church spreads and spreads. And it, and it grows and grows. It, it started in Jerusalem, but then it kept growing growing and spreading and it spread to Judea and then it spread from there to, to Samaria and again that's the first nine chapters of the book but then in chapter 10 there's like there's like a, like a, a change in chapter 10 there's there's like a new phase because now in chapter 10 now the gospel begins to reach the rest of the world the 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 the, the, the ends of the earth and of course, that happens when, when, when first of all, Peter was, was sent uh, by the Lord to, to a Gentile's house by the name of Cornelius. 
And so he, he goes there, but you have to understand that, that, that up until this point, you know, Christianity was, was basically a Jewish thing that Gentiles didn't understand. It was, you know, basically <clears throat> considered a, pardon me, <clears throat> allergies. Did I mention those? But it was predominantly considered a, 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 a sect of the Jewish religion because basically up until now, it was just Jewish people who were believing in Jesus and becoming Christians, accepting Jesus as their Messiah, as their, as their Savior. But now all of a sudden, the Lord sends Peter to, to this Gentile's house named Cornelius. Peter goes there. He, he starts preaching the gospel to Cornelius. And, and, and while Peter was still preaching, suddenly the Holy Spirit comes upon Cornelius and all the Gentiles that are there, and they start speaking in tongues too. Just like what had happened in, in, in Acts chapter 2. These guys start speaking in tongues. And in fact, this has been called the Gentile Pentecost. Now we might wonder, well, well, well why, why, why did Cornelius and these Gentiles start speaking in tongues? Well, I think in this case, it was a sign to, to Peter and, 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 to, and to the rest of the Jewish Christians. It was a sign to them that, that these Gentiles really did get saved and really did become Christians. But you have to understand that, that, that guys like Peter and, and, and anyone who was Jewish in those days was raised with, 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 a, with a deep hatred and, 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 and deep prejudice against anyone who was not Jewish, against the so-called Gentiles. In fact, they were taught to believe that Gentiles were, were created by God just to be kindling for the flames of hell. And so, perhaps the Holy Spirit comes upon uh, these Gentiles to, to, quite frankly, show them that, that there's no difference between the Gentiles and, and these Jewish believers in Jesus. That, that the same Holy Spirit who, who came upon Peter, the, the same Holy Spirit who came upon John, the same Holy Spirit who came upon uh, James has now come upon Cornelius and these Gentiles. That there's absolutely no difference. This is why the Bible says in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And so from this point on, we see this shift where, where now it, it's not just the Jews. Now we see that the gospel is now going out to the Gentiles as well. And by the way, something else we see in the book of Acts. Throughout the book of Acts, we, we saw that the Holy Spirit was, was constantly being poured out on, on, you know, on believers again and again and again. It, it was not just a one-time act. It's not just a one-time event that happened in Acts chapter 2, but it kept happening. We see it happen in chapter 10 with Cornelius. We see it happen again and again and again. And then throughout this book, we see miracles, and we see healings, and we see all these things. In fact, my wife was, was reminding me of this last night, that, that, that everything we read about in the book of Acts, that took place over a 30-year period of time. Over three decades. In fact, I really wanted to really illustrate how, 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 how that felt. And so we were originally going to teach this in 30 years. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> And so we read all about these miracles, and we tend to think, oh, man, it was just like every week, every day, you know, 24-7, it was like, bam, 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 bam. All these things happened. It was, you know, they were happening, but it was over three decades. And i got to tell you that, that in a normal sense, that these things are still happening today. The, the, the Holy Spirit's still alive. The Holy Spirit still ministers. The Holy Spirit is still moving and doing things. He didn't die. And, 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 so, and so with this, we see over and over again in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit would, would come upon people and he'd keep moving upon people and he was being poured out on people, reminding us that, that God gives refills. You know, kind of like when you go over to, to Pizza Hut for, for lunch and, 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 and the waitress gives you a big pitcher of Coke and she just keeps refilling it and keeps filling it up and, and it never, let, not, never lets get empty. It's, it's always being refilled. Or maybe like when you go to Red Robin and, and you get the bottomless fries. That's right, I just said it. Red Robin. You know, see how programmed you are? And so we see this over and over again. And, and, and the church is growing and the church is spreading and the Holy Spirit's being poured out. But, 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 but as, we, as we saw, this was a book that, that never ended. It, it, it was a never ending book. And so then in chapters 13 through 28, now the, the Apostle Paul sort of takes center stage. And so Paul comes on the scene, and, and he goes on all these different mission trips. And, and if you remember, he was being sent out by, by the church in Antioch to, to, to bring the gospel to these Gentile regions and these Gentile cities, frankly, to, to the ends of the earth, as far as the Jews were concerned. 
And so in, in chapters 16 through 19 in particular, we saw that the Apostle Paul is, is planting churches in all these different places. Places like, 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 like the city of Philippi and, and Thessalonica and, and Corinth and even the city of, of Ephesus. But you see, these were not just, just, just large metropolitan cities, but more than that, they, they were also pagan strongholds where, where now all of a sudden the gospel is going to, and, and, and the gospel is being preached, and, and people are being saved, hundreds of people, thousands of people, and churches were being planted there. <clears throat> now one of the, the other interesting things that we see in, in, in the book of Acts is, is that it seems that the farther and farther we, we get from Acts chapter 2, the more and more people we see who do not have the Holy Spirit. It seems like the farther and farther we get from Acts chapter 2, the more and more people we see that, that do not have the Holy Spirit. For example, in, in Acts chapter 18, we, we meet this couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. They got married because their names rhymed. Isn't that cute? Now, I don't know why they get married, but they just... And so this, this married couple, they, they meet a guy by the name of, of, of Apollos. Now, if you remember, the text implied that, that Apollos was this, this, this very gifted, dynamic public speaker. I mean, the kind of guy that, that, could, that could take a, a tech support manual and read it and make it sound entertaining. <laughs> and so they're listening to him, but as they're listening to this guy, they, they just get this sense that, that something's not quite right, that, that, that something's missing. In fact, in Acts chapter 18, verse 25, it says that, that Apollos taught accurately the things of the Lord, but he only knew the baptism of John, John the Baptist. <clears throat> now, 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 keep in mind. John the Baptist was, was, this, was this, this radical, fiery preacher, right? I mean, he was this bold preacher, and people flocked by, by the thousands to him to, to, to check out this radical man with this radical message saying, repent and, and be baptized, re, re, repent, and, and because, because the kingdom of God is at hand. This man who would uh, say, turn away from your sins because the Messiah is coming. Now, now ultimately, that's the message that, that Apollos had heard. Now, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, they're, they're going to they're explain all this to Apollos, and they're, and they're going to help him understand this. But, but you see, the, the thing is, is that although the message was accurate, it was incomplete. It was accurate, but it was incomplete. It was accurate because it was pointing to Jesus, but it was incomplete because by the time of Apollos, Jesus had already come. It wasn't that Jesus is coming. Jesus had already coming. He had already died on the cross for our sins. He had already ascended into heaven. So it was accurate, but incomplete. And so they, they, they would have explained these things to him. And then in the very next verses, in, in, in chapter 19, then the Apostle Paul happens to meet a group of disciples in, in Ephesus. And he asked them, he said, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And, and they said, we, we've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul says, well, then what in the world were you baptized into? And they said, well, the, the baptism of John the Baptist. And so then at that point, uh, Paul then explains that, that John was actually pointing to Jesus. And having explained that, then, then, then these guys immediately, they, 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 they receive Jesus into their hearts. They get baptized in water. Paul lays hands on them and, and prays for them. And while he's praying for them, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And this shows us that there were, there were two different baptisms. There was the baptism of John the Baptist, but then there was the baptism of Jesus. Two different baptisms. In fact, listen to, to John the Baptist's own words. John the Baptist said in, in Matthew uh, 3.11, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is, is mightier than I, than whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so there's two baptisms, the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. Uh, I like the way another Calvary Chapel pastor named John Corson put this. John Corson said, quote, John's baptism was a sign of repentance, whereas Jesus' baptism was a sign of regeneration. And so, ultimately, the, the baptism of Jesus was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. There, back in Acts chapter 2. 
We're, we're, we're again, the 120 are gathered in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. They start speaking in tongues. Suddenly, 3,000 people become Christians and give their lives to Jesus. And in that moment, the church was born. But then as we illustrated this morning, the church grew and grew, and it spread and spread. It, it did not stay in Jerusalem. It spread to the ends of the earth. It, it, and it took us all the way from chapter 2 to chapter 28. But as we mentioned, it doesn't stop in chapter 28. And listen, we are chapter 29. You and I, we, we, we are the living, unfinished chapter of, of this book. We're, 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 the, the story still lives. Listen, the Holy Spirit is still moving. The Holy Spirit still comes upon and, and, and empowers his believers today. And can I say to you that the, that the church today still has the same marching orders that the church back then had. To go into all of the world with the gospel. We still have the same marching orders, but just like they needed the Holy Spirit, we cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you the, the same question that Paul basically asked those, those Ephesian believers in Acts chapter 19. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit when, when, when you believed? You see, listen, and, and we've talked about this extensively before, but but but... When, when, when you get saved, when, when you receive Jesus Christ, instantly uh, the, the Bible teaches that, that you become filled with the Holy Spirit. The instantly, the moment you become a Christian, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, also 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. But listen, being filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit coming upon you are not the same thing. They're not synonyms. They, they, they don't mean the same thing. And so the, the moment you become a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit fill you and, and comes to you. Why is he inside you? To change you. He, he's going to live there now. But once he decides to live in you, he's going to clean house. He's like, dude, that's got to go. That's really snowy. That has really got to go. He starts cleaning house. He starts changing you from the inside out. And so you don't need a pastor to change you. You don't need a psychologist to change you. It's not behavior modification. No, Jesus comes inside you, and he starts changing you. And people start seeing the change. They start noticing you're not the same person you used to be. There's, there's something different about you. They, they, they notice the change, and, and they can see the Holy Spirit's presence and work inside your life. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. But what's, being, what, what, what's having the Holy Spirit come upon you? Well, the Bible says the Holy Spirit comes upon you to empower you. To give you power to be his witness. It doesn't come upon you to make you weird. That only happens on Christian television. Sorry. He doesn't come upon you to, to, to make you freak out and do crazy things. He comes upon you to, to, to be his witnesses. Because you have a commission, a great commission, to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. But you cannot change a single person's life in your own strength. You can't change a person's heart in your own ability. That can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. Now, I believe instantly that, that, that there are some people, the moment they receive Jesus, both of those things happen. Did I just say both? Yo, dog, both of those things happen. All two of them. So, sorry about that. My, my, my hood came back. Um, but the moment, the, the instant you, you receive Christ, instantly both of those things happen. You are instantly filled with the Holy Spirit, but then there are some people that at the same time, the Holy Spirit comes upon them as well. The Holy Spirit comes inside them and starts changing them from the inside out, but at the same time, the Holy Spirit came upon them and, and empowered them so they can start being used right away. But then there's others, and, and, and it's like two separate things. They, they accept Christ, and instantly the Holy Spirit fills them. And he starts changing them from the inside out. But then on a later occasion, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Like we see what happens here in Acts chapter 19 with, with these guys in the, in the city of Ephesus. When Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? The Holy Spirit came upon them on a, on a different occasion. And so with that, you know, maybe, maybe there, there, there are some in this room that, that, you know, man, the Holy Spirit came into your life, but has he come upon you? I've illustrated before, but this is what happened to Dwight Moody, the, the famous preacher from back in the 1800s. Now, as the story goes, Dwight Moody, uh, in his early days of ministry, kind of struggled. He would go and he'd preach at places, but, but he was kind of ineffective. I mean, only, only a small handful of people would, would respond. 
And then one day he met these two ladies. One was named Auntie Cook and the other was named Mrs. Mrs. Snow. And they told him that they had been praying for him to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. He had no idea what that meant. And so they explained it to him. And, and so he prayed and he prayed and he prayed about this for, for quite a long time. And then on his own, uh, as he's just walking down the street all by himself, the Holy Spirit came upon him. He had to, to go into a person's house and ask to be locked in a room, and, and the Holy Spirit just came upon him. But, but, but those who know him say that his, his, his life and his ministry changed from that point on. That, that from that point on, there was something different. And now all of a sudden, hundreds and even thousands were coming forward when he would preach the gospel. But Moody goes on to say that it wasn't a one-time event. That, that, that he, had, he had a number of times that the Holy Spirit came upon him. That he was continually filling, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he was asked about this, he, you know, why the Holy Spirit would keep coming upon him and why he needed the Holy Spirit to keep coming upon him, he answered and said, because I leak. <laughs> In fact, the same thing happened to Billy Graham. Now, many of us know that Billy Graham just, just recently went home to be with the Lord. And yet, we're told that in the early days of Billy Graham's ministry, he was meeting with a, a Welsh evangelist who was, who was telling him how, how his life and his ministry changed when, when he encountered the Holy Spirit. And as Billy was listening to this, he, he, he realized that that's what he needed, that that's what was missing in his life and in his ministry. He realized that, that that's why his ministry up until this point was so ineffective, because he didn't have what this guy was talking about. So he prayed, and, and the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, when the Holy Spirit came upon Billy Graham, he, didn't, he did not start speaking in tongues. He, he didn't roll over. He didn't fall down. He didn't froth at the mouth. None of those things. It was just a very quiet experience. But from that moment on, his ministry was different. People now said that there, were, there was power in his words. And we all know the rest of the story. Millions and millions and millions of people have come to Christ because of the ministry of Billy Graham. That couldn't happen without the Holy Spirit. In fact, on another occasion, Billy Graham was, was doing a crusade in a, in a very liberal state, and they didn't want him there. In fact, the, 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 the church leaders uh, said, you know what, we, we don't want him here. He's too conservative. He's too old-fashioned. Uh, he, he's going to set evangelism back 50 years in this city. Well, Billy Graham overheard this, and, and so he said, you know, I apologize for misrepresenting my intentions. And then he said this. He said, I don't want to set evangelism back 50 years. I want to set evangelism back 2,000 years. That's, that's my Billy Graham impersonation. And you know what? This is what the church needs today. The church needs to be set back 2,000 years. We need a reset. We need, we need to get back to our roots in the book of Acts. We need to be a church that is, get, again, carrying out the Great Commission, reaching the lost with the gospel. But listen, we can't do this without the Holy Spirit. If we step out in our own strength and our own ability and we share certain words with them, they'll just be words. When we step out in, in the power of the Holy Spirit, those are now words of conviction and words of power and words of change in a person's life. And so, Father, we, we thank you for, for, for your grace. And Jesus, we thank you that, that you, you told us that when you, let, when you leave, another would come, the Holy Spirit. That you haven't left us, you're powerless. And so before we take communion, Lord, we just want to spend a, a, a couple minutes in your presence, just, just, just basking in your presence. Holy Spirit, we pray that, that, that you would fall afresh. Just pour out your spirit, Lord. We, we, we pray that, that, that in this room, Lord, we would be open vessels receiving what you would have for us. Lord, I, I know that there are many in this room that, that they, 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 they love you. They, they are like Theophilus. They are lovers of God. And they received the, your, your Holy Spirit into their hearts the moment they, they received you. And some of them, Lord, they, they've been empowered. You, you, you've come upon them. But there's others, Lord, that, that man, they love you, but they just they want to be used by you. And they, and they don't know why it, it's so hard. They don't know why every time they, they step out and they try to serve and they try to be used by you that, it, that it's just futile and, it, and, it's, and it's empty and it just, it's not working. Could it be that they're running on empty? I wonder if that's them. I, I pray that, that your Holy Spirit would fall afresh on them. Not to freak them out, but Lord, to, to, to empower them. To, to use them, to make them useful to you. 
Or maybe, Lord, there's others in this room that, man, you know, we've, we've been filled with the Holy Spirit when we believed in you. We've, we've even had the Holy Spirit come upon us, but, but these days it's kind of dry. These days it, it's, it's kind of empty. You know, we leak, and now we're empty. And maybe we need a fresh move, a, a refill. And we thank you that you're the God of refills. Listen, if this is you, if, if, you, if you need the, the freshness of the Holy Spirit to, to fall upon you, to, to restore in you the joy of your salvation, to, to fill you anew, to make you useful, just, just spend some time with the Lord and, and in your own way. Maybe maybe just stretch out your hands of what, as if you're receiving something from Him. But just ask that, that His Spirit would come upon you. But several people here in this room do this. Just, just ask the Lord. There you go. Just, you know, Lord, come upon me. But I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid you're going to make me weird. I'm not afraid that things are going to get crazy. I need a refill. What did you receive from the Lord this morning? And see what he does. When it happened to Billy Graham, it was quiet. It was nothing crazy. But it was effective. So now as you're, as you're just... Focusing on the Lord, the, the ushers are going to come discreetly. They're going to they're going to deliver uh, the elements of communion this morning. But remember this: that 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 wafer, that that bread, that, that that was meant to remind us of the body of Christ broken for us, and that cup that, that of juice that was meant to remind us of the blood of Christ that was shed for us. But if you remember the story, when Jesus shared these elements with his disciples. After he, after he broke bread with them and they ate this meal, he then said to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now it was repeated again in Acts chapter 1, but, but he told them during that meal to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning as you're taking these elements, listen, that's a promise for you. The Holy Spirit wants to come upon you. He wants to, he, he wants to, he wants to not only fill you, but pour over you. You're not a cup to be filled. You're, 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 a, you're a funnel to be poured through. He wants others to receive what he's, what he's doing in you. He wants to use you. He wants you to leave this place different. He wants you to leave empowered. So after you spend some time with the Lord, in your own time, when you're ready, then you can take those elements. Let's just spend some time worshiping.